further ado, I want to invite uh, uh, Mike to step up to the virtual podium and tell us a bit about um, B2B customer experience from your point of view. So, Mike, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Well, let me first get in here and uh, share my screen. Um, let us just uh, get here. Okay, so everyone, can you see my slides and hear my voice? Fantastic. Thanks for the thumbs up there, David. Okay, well, look, the last six months for, for many of us have um, certainly highlighted something that's been very clear to those um, like myself that work in the digital transformation space, but it's become clear for everyone. Um, and that is that most organizations have a real inability to react and adapt fast enough to changing conditions. And this is felt more so than most in large sort of globally matrixed organizations, and especially for those in and responsible for customer experience. Why? Because they're closest to the customer. They're the ones that are seeing, feeling, hearing things more than anyone else. And then they're also feeling extremely hamstrung in order to be able to deliver that changing requirement and need from the customers. And, and the problem is that when this is happening in organizations, we're finding that we start to, in most cases, blame individuals for not being able to adapt. And you may have felt this over the last four or five months. I mean, some organizations that I consult to a lot of the leadership team, you know, I see their behavior, their fear coming, coming through and starting to, to fil filter down. Um, in some cases, quite dictatorial um, in, their, in their approaches. But the sort of long and short of it is when that happens, we start to blame each other. We start to blame individuals and we spend money then to try and improve their performance. So we spend a huge amount of money either sending them on training courses, be it virtual now, you know, um, it might well be the software that we put in place to try and control the behavior of those individuals so that they can work and perform better now that this environment is changing. And I want to put it to you today that, for the large organizations and particularly in the customer experience space, but it, it really is relevant across the board is that we're focusing and spending the money in the wrong place. If we want to really bring about that adaptive change ready performance from our teams. So let me give you an example of, sort of where money is, is being spent badly. Maybe if, if any of you out there can just sort of drop down, anyone recognize this building that should be showing on your screen now? Just put it in the chat, chance to get a bit interactive. Okay, it is the Burj Khalifa, that's right. So it's the, it's the Burj Khalifa, it's the tallest building in the world. And last year, $16 billion was, was spent on performance management software. So I'm using this as an example, right? So $16 billion was spent helping to improve people's performance, monitor them, KPIs. Now, if you were to take $16 billion and turn it into single dollar bills, that would fill 11 Burj Khalifas. So 11 of these buildings you see in front of them, full of single dollar bills, spent on performance management software last year. Okay. Now, when executives were asked, was that software of use, did they see that improved performance? 8% of them said it did. 8% said it added value. That's 92% that say that that 16 billion didn't achieve any value for the organization. Okay, so in Burj Khalifa terms, because we're talking in Burj Khalifa rather than money, that's 10 Burj Khalifas full of single dollar bills wasted trying to improve our team's performance. And particularly now our team's performance in times which require them to be adaptive. So if they shouldn't be spending their money on individuals to improve those performances, where should they be spending that money? Well, in order to help you do that, I want to take you back and I want you just to, for some of you, close your eyes, imagine, but I want to tell you, pretend you're back in 1972. Okay. In 1972, you've just left work. On your way home from work, you're supposed to be running an errand. And that errand is to pick up some shopping for home. And as you get to the shops, you've forgotten what it what it was you were supposed to be there for. So what do you do? 
you go to this thing called a phone booth, which you can see in front of you now. Now, for those millennials amongst you, before we had mobile phones, we had phone booths, and these were stationary phones where you would go and make a phone call. I'm only joking. But so you go into there, you run into your phone booth, and you make the call, you ring home, and you say, right, what was it I was supposed to buy? Ah, okay. Now, on your way out of the phone booth, someone passing in front of you with a whole bunch of papers drops their papers in front of you, and they sprawl all over the floor. How many of you would help that person who's just dropped their stuff? Just in the chat box here, just, just write. If you think you would do it, say yes. If you think no, say no. I'd like to think most of us are um, good human beings here. Um, and we would probably try and try and do that. It's not getting much answers there from everyone. Yes, okay, we have, we've had a couple of yeses. And we do, that's what we would think, right? We would think we would help. Now, what I've just described to you in that scenario is actually an experiment that was run in the 70s. And what they found was when that person left the phone booth, only 4%, 4% only of people helped. Now, if I say that number to business leaders now, they tend to think that there's something wrong with the experiment and they, or they blame the individual. Oh, they must have been really busy or it's a bad area of town. That's, that's what happened. They re-ran that experiment. And when they re-ran it, this time what they did, they just changed one thing. They put a 10 cent coin, a dime, in the phone booth, ready for that person making that phone call to find. This time, when they went in, they found the 10 cents, they made the phone call, hey, they got a free phone call. When they stepped outside and someone walking past them again, an actor dropped the papers in front of them. This time during the experiment, that number jumped from 4% from to 88%, 88%. Now the behavior of that individual was changed, not because they had any training, not because they were better people, it was run at the same time of day, in the same venue, but they changed the game rather than the player. And that's really what we need to try and do. But when I talk to, um, people about this, they say, well, no, 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 no. We, we can't do that. There's no way these experiments can be true. There must have been something going on. Our intuition wants us to believe that the decisions that we make as individuals are a function of our values, our beliefs, our upbringing. We want to feel in control as individuals. Our intuition struggles to believe that people's decisions and the way in which we respond and react can be affected by such small changes to their context, such small changes to what they do. So if context matters so much, then why don't we change it? Why are we spending all this money trying to get our teams to be more adaptive, complaining that they don't change enough, trying to make them more change ready? Why are we spending it on them as individuals when really we should be spending money on the context? Now, if we wanna change the context, we've gotta decide what we're gonna change it in terms of what is it we're looking for? Ultimately, we want to improve people's performance. We want them to become more change ready so that they can deal with the difference and the constantly rapidly changing times, particularly in the customer experience world that they're seeing right now. So if we want to change performance. Before I get onto how we do it, I just want to be clear that we understand what I mean by performance. Now, there are two types of performance in this context. The first and the one we're extremely good at is tactical performance, particularly in large global organizations. You know, how well can you follow a plan? Large organizations around the world have built into global organizations because they are extremely good at this, because they are extremely good at laying out a structure, building a hierarchy, creating a system that allows people to know what to do in certain circumstances and to follow those rules. Okay, that's what's allowed scale. This is what's built the large global organizations over the last over the last 20 30 30 years so most organizations tend to be good at that following a plan that tactical performance what they struggle with and where the key lies is in that oh shit moment which is really how effectively they can diverge when a plan goes wrong so when things aren't going as they should do when covid19 hits and we've got to decide a customer experience team what do we do now how does that change 
how effectively we can diverge from the plan is the second type of performance. And that's the one that's lacking in the majority of organizations in today's time. So I want you to think of these two things as a yin and yang, right? So on one side, you've got tactical performance and that's gonna allow you to effectively follow a plan. We tend to be all really, really good at this. And the other side is the adaptive performance and they are yin and yang. The moment one gets too strong, the other one really, really does start to get smaller, okay? They're two opposites, but we need to find a balance between the two of them. So imagine you're in your, your team and you're in a tactical, very tactical business. You're great at following strategy, you know, and your, how well you succeed is determined by the targets that you are given within your team. Now, if you sit in a very tactical driven um, environment and suddenly there's a new, really high risk, um, but very high value opportunity that comes up, you aren't likely to take it. You aren't likely to adapt and change in order to take that on because that tactical performance, that system of tactical performance is far too strong and it's killing that adaptive performance. What you tend to find is the way that organizations like that are run is they want to control or change the employee's behavior. So the way in which they do it, particularly in a large organization, we need to send the mandate down. What we do is we increase bureaucracy, more paperwork, you know, and that will allow us to control the behavior. But by doing that, all you're doing is increasing your tactical performance and in turn your adaptive performance is being, being destroyed. As it starts to be destroyed, you need to put more change in behavior because people aren't able to respond quick enough. You know, they're not being adaptive, so let's control it more. Let's try and control them to be adaptive. And this cycle is unfortunately happening and it's, it's meaning that many of the larger organizations are really struggling to adapt to the times that we find ourselves in today. So if tactical performance is driven by strategy, we're all very, very good at strategy, particularly in our large organizations and in our customer experience teams, you know, we pull that strategy out at the beginning of the year. This is what we're going to do for the year. We get it signed off by the um, chief financial officer goes up. Yeah, that's the strategy. That is what you're going to perform for the year. Okay. That's our strategy. We tend to be quite good at that. What is it that drives adaptive performance? What should we be focusing on? to drive that adaptive performance? The answer, the answer lies in culture. Culture is the thing that is gonna enable adaptive performance. So that's where we should be spending our money rather than on focusing on individuals, KPIs, big billions of dollars spend on these performance management software and, and systems. So before I go on, I wanna be clear what I mean by culture. Well, actually what I don't mean by culture. What I don't mean is ping pong tables and really nice areas for people to mess around in. I don't mean go and create a coffee shop, hipster vibe, so that people are relaxed and can talk over coffee. And I sure as hell do not mean these freaking orange floating balls that are supposed to be good for your back, right? They're all things that are gonna make your team happy, don't get me wrong, but they are not gonna improve performance. Okay. The thing that improves performance, particularly in this adaptive space, actually lies in motivation. Okay. So we have to focus on motivation of individuals in order to make them more adaptive. And let me talk you through that. So let me talk you through that. Let me explain firstly, the type of motivation that is going to kill adaptive performance. The first is when you're motivated or your teams are motivated, by emotional pressure. What do I mean by emotional pressure? It's if you're in the work and you're doing the work and you feel like you're there because you don't want to let anyone down. You don't want to let your team down. So that's why you're working the late nights. That's why you're doing everything you can to get what you need to get done to hit that target because you don't want to let the team down. The emotional pressure might come from somewhere else. It might well be that you're the first person to have that high level executive job in a really well-known global organization within your family. And they sacrificed everything for you to go to university, to earn the money to get into that position. And you don't wanna let them down, okay? When you find yourself in that situation with emotional pressure, what happens is you don't wanna lose your job. That is first and foremost, you are there. The pressure is not to let people down, so you do not wanna lose that job. Now, what's the best way of not losing your job? 
It's to follow the rules. It's to stick to the plan. No one ever got fired from a job for doing what they were told, for following the strategy. No one ever got fired for that. Okay? So that is what happens when you have emotional pressure. You find yourselves doing, following the plan in order to, to remain safe. And if you're following the plan, and you're being tactical, you're not likely to step aside and do something different and be tactical, uh, sorry, be adaptive when the moment requires. The second and even worse than emotional pressure is if you, you or your team are in your jobs and you feel you're there for, for economic reasons. So there is economic pressure. You need to stay in your job to pay the bills, to feed your family. If you find yourself in that situation, again, even more so, you do not want to lose your job. You cannot lose your job. You have to remain safe. And in order to remain safe, what do you do? You follow the plan. Because no one ever got fired for following the plan and following the strategy. Even worse than that, even worse than emotional and economic pr pr pressure, is if you find yourself in this position where you are in work and you are there with sort of no motivation at all. It's just become inertia. It's just there because that's the way you've always done things. And you'll know those people in your organizations, the strongest people with that, mot with that inertia motivation, is they're the ones that always say to you when you want to try and change things, that's not the way we do things here. We've never done it like that. Or even clever, and they're often smart. So they've been in the organization for five to 10 years. And they say, well, we tried that once, and you know what, it didn't work. And they give you a really strong, rational argument and it kills the conversation for being adaptive. And if you live in that inertia space, we all have those people, we all know those people, that's gonna kill adaptive performance more than anything else. So if those are the motivations that kill adaptive performance, what are the motivations that we need to focus our culture on to drive adaptive performance within our teams? Well, the first is potential. If you can ensure that your teams are there because they see the correlation between the work that they're doing and the potential that they believe they can give as an individual, that they can fulfill that potential, bring all of themselves to the job, not just that pigeonholed area that we might have put themselves in. That alignment with potential is gonna make them more adaptive. Why? Because when something goes wrong, when the strategy is no longer working, they have something else driving them beyond that strategy where they can see the work is aligned and they can go, well, actually, if I go and try this and do something slightly different to try and get to where we need to get to, they're more likely to do it if it aligns with the potential that they can see in themselves. Also, the other thing that comes with potential is a belief in themselves that their boss and their organization believes in what they can do. So they feel safer within that environment. Even more powerful than potential as a motivator for adaptability is purpose. Okay, and we hear a lot about purpose, Simon Sinek's why talks. And I know Dan is going to talk a little bit more about purpose, um, more specifically in the customer experience space as well in a bit. But when you have your team and your individuals aligned to the purpose of the organization and it aligns with their purpose, they become hugely adaptive. Because now when something isn't going wrong in the tactical side of things, when something isn't going wrong in the strategy, they feel safer trying something new experimenting, going off the path. Because why? They've got this shining light of a purpose that they can aim towards, that they can say, well, I was always aiming to get there. Yes, we went off strategy, but remember our purpose. And that strategy wasn't working. So now I'm trying this in order to get to that, that purpose. And if they see the organization around them making decisions based on their values, aligned with their purpose, more so than the bottom line numbers, they're going to feel safer going in that space. It's like Dorothy with the Wizard of Oz, right? The purpose is the Emerald City. Dorothy wasn't a straight line. The Yellow Brick Road wasn't straight to get to the Emerald City. It was curvy. It was wavy. They had to go a different road, route. They had to try something new. All going to the, their purpose, all going to where they wanted to get to, the Emerald City. But they had to change direction. And people whose purposes are aligned with the organizations, are more likely to follow that winding yellow brick road to be able to adapt and change in order to get to where they need to get to. So purpose is critical as a motivation. But the thing you can do for your culture more than anything else is when your staff come to work and they get a sense of play. 
if they feel that they can come there and the work that they do is play. Now, I'm not, again, talking about ping pong tables. Okay. I'm talking about the ability to try things, to experiment, to fail. Like how, when I mean, I've got a young five-year-old and nine-year-old, they love Lego and they'll build a bridge. That's their aim. That's what they have to do. They start building it. It's not working. What do they do? They change it. They maybe build a different support. They maybe go a different, different route, but they're in that sense of play. And we need to do that within our organization's cultures as well. If we can bring about that sense of play, adaptability, the willingness and the ability to be able to fail if they try something and be okay and not be chastised for it. And to learn from that, share that learning across the organization, try something new. That is where you really start to get huge adaptability within, within an organization. Now that doesn't mean when you're playing, you're inventing constantly. You could be someone in your team that's responsible for, let's say the analytics within the customer experience team. Okay. And as you're looking at those, those analytics, they're done in a particular way and you have to produce a report the same way every time. Now, if you're in a sense of play, you'll be asking the question, well, actually, is this adding value? Should I make, maybe if I change it this week, maybe I'm gonna do it like this. Maybe let's not use that spreadsheet. I've thought of a different way of doing it. And as you present it, it might not present as well. And um, the team might not get the information you need, but they'll give you, be able to give you feedback that goes, actually, it doesn't work as well as the last one, but we like what you were going with here and you get that sense of play. So I'm talking about play in that sense that you can do in your everyday tasks for your everyday jobs. So just to summarize, the closer the motivation is to the work itself, the more adaptable your teams will become. So if you can, you'll see on this, on this diagram here, you know, you've got the external forces, the emotion, economic inertia that is driving tactical performance. Per play purpose potential is close to the work itself. It's therefore making you more, more adaptive. And if you can focus on those within your customer experience teams, you're gonna create a team that can really change and feel that's okay with change and is able to adapt really, really quickly as new things are thrown at you, which is obviously the key in today's, in today's environment. Now, someone that did this incredibly well um, rather than tell you a story about the um, office and workspace, I'm going to tell you a story about uh, the greatest naval battle of all time. Does anyone recognize um, this gentleman? Maybe put it in the chat if anyone, anyone recognizes him. Nelson. No, it's not Nelson. You were reading the notes for the, for the thing. Yes. It is. It's Napoleon Bonaparte. That's right. Well done, David. Um, now, in 1805, off the coast of Spain, in the battle of the highest stakes, Napoleon Bonaparte had assembled a fleet of 40 ships to invade England. The only person standing in his way was Great Britain's Admiral Lord Nelson. Now, to get into the part for this um, and really tell the story properly, I'm actually going to come off sharing my screen. Okay, um, can you see me again now? I'm assuming you can. Um, as I talk, uh, can I pin my video? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so you should be seeing me now. Right, in order to do this properly, I need to get into parts. So you're gonna need to excuse me for 30 seconds. Now there's not very often that I get the opportunity to really be British, now living in um, Cape Town. So really to tell this story properly, I need to get in the part of uh, Nelson. Um, you can see from this that I do enjoy uh, dressing up. Um, you should see what I make my wife wear. Actually, that's, <laughs> that's an inappropriate comment and it's, it's, a, it's a totally different talk um, for a very, very different conference right here. So, Okay, in order to understand what Nelson did, we need to understand how battles were fought in the 1800s. Now, Nelson was likely to lose this battle to Napoleon. Why? Because battles were fought in this way. What they would do is the French would line up here, all in a row with their ships, and the British would line up here. And then it was really a matter of who had the biggest ships, 
who had the biggest guns. Now in this battle, the French had a quarter more ships, the ships were more modern, and they were more powerful cannons. So what would happen would be everyone would fire up here, they'd do the firing, and these would fire back. And it was just really who, had, who could fire most, one with the most ships left, won. The French were bound to win this, win this fight. The other reason for ships being laid out at this time was a matter of control. So what would happen would be the commander would sit on a ship here and he would watch what was going on with the battle. And he would then be able to wave his flag. The next ship along would see, wave his flag and commands were sent along the line in order to tell people what to do. So it was a matter of firepower and control. And that's why they lined up like that. Nelson realized if he fought his battle like this, it wouldn't work. So what he did was something very, very different. He tried a strategy where adaptability was key. What he did was there was a tactical element to this plan. Firstly, he was going to run his ships into the French line in pairs like this. So now the French, as, the, as this was happening, would be able to fire on the British ships, but the British, unfortunately, couldn't. They were firing because their cannons only go out the side of the ships this way. So they knew they were going to have to take on fire. But the ultimate aim here was to get to a point where the British found themselves in between the French ships. So now the French could only fire in this direction and this direction. So they couldn't hit the British ships, but the British could fire in these directions now and aim for the French ships. So they'd lined themselves up. The only problem was when this happens, no one can give commands anymore. So that idea of being able to have a structure where the person at the top follow a plan no longer worked. Why was Nelson able to do this where the French weren't and Napoleon and his, his fleet in, bat in battle weren't able to do this? Well, it's because Napoleon had worked on over the years preceding this battle on the three things that drive adaptability within an organization or within a culture. He created a culture that grew adaptability. He believed in potential. So by placing the captains in this position, he was telling them, I trust you. I trust your potential. He spent two years prior to this time spending dinner with the captains, talking about strategy, them sharing their ideas, him sharing his ideas. He created this learning culture that enabled that ability for him to trust them when they were in that space. He'd also created a culture that allowed them to experiment. They'd spoken through millions of different scenarios of what could happen here. So that when they found themselves in these positions, the captains could experiment. And he'd also given them a purpose. On the morning of the battle, the only thing he told them was that no captain can do wrong than to place his ship beside that of the enemy. England expects you to do your duty and at the end of the day to lay anchor in, in port. Very, very simple instruction. Spoke to duty, purpose, you know, where they, where they want to get to. Would have got them all, all the captains riled up. Even more so why this was important during the battle was because at the start, when Napoleon was driving his troops into, sorry, Nelson was driving his ships into this position, he was shot. And he spent the entire battle of Trafalgar actually in the, in the galley. He didn't see a thing and he died, unfortunately, after the battle. So Nelson didn't actually participate in the battle of Trafalgar. But what he'd done was he created a culture which grew purpose, believed in potential, and allowed people to play. And that allowed them to be adaptive and win against very, very tactically driven um, organization, uh, um, uh, French, and, uh, French and Spanish ships. So I'm just gonna put my last slides up. Um, let me just go here. And just talk you now to show you my very, very last thing, because I know I've run out of time, I've gone a little bit over time. Um, what we're finding in organizations now, oh, I've pinned my thing. Let me just unpin. 
uh, unpin video. There we go. Um, what we're finding in organizations now, what we're talking about here has been seen in the cultures that are succeeding in these rapidly changing times and what I would call the digitally mature organizations. Those organizations, you can see from this um, slide that those just starting their digital transformation journey are very, very far behind in terms of performance, those that are digitally mature. And the cultures that are coming out, this is from the latest information from MIT Sloan last year on cultures in organizations that are digitally mature. You can see that those that have distributed the decision making come away from the hierarchy and been able to get it to the person closest to the customer, closest to the product, are performing better. Those that have created cultures that allow people to be bold and exploratory have enabled performance to go up. And those that have allowed those people to react quickly and respond quickly and build an agile way of working are also showing greater levels of performance. So if you want to become adaptable and you want to, you want to see your teams being able to cope with change better, you need to focus on culture. And within culture, you need to focus on play, purpose, and potential. And if you can focus on those three things, you'll find your teams and your organizations will be able to really thrive in these rapidly changing times. If any of you found that interesting, what I've spoken about, um, there's a few books that this um, talk was, was based around. These slides will be shared with you so you can pull those out. Um, yeah, and you feel free to contact me um, as and when you need to. David, back to you. I feel very inadequate not um, having a costume to, um, to, to share at uh, this time. And uh, when you do that uh, presentation about you and your wife, uh, please put me down to join. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm up for that one. Um, it's fascinating. She's not tuned in. <laughs> Thank you also for the link in terms of um, a purpose. So in, in, in customer experience terms, it reminds me of a very real, very practical um, example though. I want to um, use United Airlines as an example. There was a United Airlines flight going from um, Chicago, I think it was to Minneapolis. It was the last flight of the evening. Um, the, uh, the plane was pretty full and uh, everybody was sort of getting on and every seat was taken on the plane. And just as the plane, they were about to shut the doors, three pilots <clears throat> turned up uh, needing to get to Minneapolis to sort of start their day in Minneapolis next day. So the plane was full and uh, they came on the, uh, the tannoy and they said, uh, we want some volunteers. Is $50 to, to get off the plane and stay in uh, Chicago overnight. No takers. $200. They got up to $500. Nobody wanted to do that because it was the last flight and nobody wanted to stay in Chicago. So what did they do? <clears throat> um, the last folks that were on the plane were asked to get off. These were three folks. There was a, a, a dad and his two daughters who was a Korean dentist. <clears throat> and um, they said, no, we're staying on. We've got, we've got our ticket, we've got our seats, we're staying on. So what did the staff do? The staff went to get security and security dragged these people off. And this poor guy was like, clinging to his seat, he was pulled off, smashed up his teeth. His, his daughters were filming this, it went, uh, it went live. Uh, and it took 11% off the value of um, United shares. 11%, that's a shitload of money um, as a result of that uh, decision. And um, I worked with uh, United, asked the uh, experience officer, Toby, so how many of those people that were involved in it are still with the business? And he said, well, everyone. And I said, well, go on, tell me why. And he said, because well, they did. They, their view of purpose at that uh, time, Mike, was that we've got to run efficiently. Everything's based around efficiency. So we've got to get our pilots there. Customer is a long way back in terms of the intent. So they've since then focused on making sure everybody understands the purpose, yeah, to do the right thing for the, uh, for the customer. Because in the absence of rules in the middle of your battle, yeah, if you've got a clear idea of your purpose, then folks will make the right decision. So back in B2B land, when you're facing a decision, when you're in front of customers, when you've got a, shit, there isn't something in the playbook in the rule book to guide me here, what is it that's uh, our uh, purpose? That needs to guide your your staff. Um, so uh, you're absolutely right to be highlighting the, um, the, uh, <laughs> the Battle of Trafalgar as a beautiful illustration of purpose, providing that North Star, that, uh, that uh, single 
uh, thing to sail to.